I'm Dan Barker. I'm the other co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Very happy to co-sponsor this event. The other co-president, of course, you met, Annie Loy Gaylor. She's a hard act to follow, but I will, I will do my best. Our topic today is about protection for atheists and ex-Muslims and non-believers. When I left the ministry after 19 years of preaching, I suffered some consequences, but nothing close to what people in this room have suffered. So I, I hate to even compare it. I, I, lo I lost some friends. I was shunned by some uncles. And over the years, have had some threats that I don't take that seriously. One Christian cab driver said he wanted to settle the argument with a two-by-four. Things like that. Do you know what a two-by-four is? Yeah, it's a baseball bat. It's like a baseball bat, yes, okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, it has been minor. For me, it has been minor, and, and a big problem for a lot of ex-clergy, of course, is finding another job, which is one thing that the clergy project is dealing with. But we're talking today about the need for protection for people who really are under serious problems. And I, I think what we'll do is I will introduce all of you first, and then maybe we'll just go down the line. And uh, each of you, maybe th for three or four minutes, tell us a little of your story and why this topic is important to you. And then I'll open up to the questions. The questions we have basically are up on the screen, but we'll open it up to those questions as we go. Ana Gonzalez. Ana Gonzalez is a lawyer who lives in London. She's an ex-Catholic atheist. I was an ex-Protestant, you know, and I thought all Catholics were going to hell, you know, but uh, <clears throat> you probably knew I was right, huh? She represents, she's a lawyer who represents vulnerable and marginalized people. She has secured refugee status for hundreds of people, and she is a volunteer lawyer for ex-Muslims of Britain. <laughs> Yaya Eku is um, founder of Liberals Network Mauritania and he's a member of the Atheist Refugee Relief, which is very important to this topic. Amadar Rashid Chowdhury. Did I say that right? I said that right. Bangladeshi, he's an award-winning author. He's the founder of Sudashar magazine. He now lives in exile because he was violently attacked for, for his opinions. Harris Sultan. <clears throat> Harris Sultan is an Australian of Pakistani uh, descent. He's the author of The Curse of God. Lilith Raza, also, also of Pakistani descent, is a queer trans activist. She works with queer refugees of Deutschland and also in, in the rest of Europe. And then the famous Nina Sankari. She's from Poland. She's the vice president of Polish atheist uh, Fundasha Kazimir Wyszynski. Is that how you say it? Yeah. <laughs> Kazimir Wyszynski was a Polish atheist who was put to death because of his views. She's also an organizer of the Atheist Days. She's an author, and she's also the co-founder of the International Association of free thought. So thank you all for being here. Let's just go down. Why don't we start with you? Tell us maybe in three or four minutes a little of your story. Uh, remember, we want, we want to leave time for discussion and for audience questions and why this topic is relevant to you. Um, so I'm Lelit, um, Pakistani descent, as you already said. And the topic is important to me because uh, back home uh, in Pakistan, in Punjab, the very first time I realized that my existence as an atheist, as an ex-Muslim, um, is in danger when uh, Salman Taseer, the governor general of Punjab, one of the biggest provinces in Pakistan, was killed by his own gunman just for defending Asia Bibi. And Asia Bibi, if you may know about her story, she recently uh, got acquitted, equ yeah, evicted from the um, blasphemy allegations and uh, the very uh, reason that she was evicted, uh, Muslims didn't like it. Why is she evicted? And I was like, that's the only pla uh, place on the planet. They're like 
the court has decided that the woman has not said anything against the prophet and now they are yelling crying on the streets like tantrum throwing babies why she didn't do it so i was the lucky one to leave the country in time and come to germany uh thank all the gods for that if there are any um and the other reason is that uh, when i came to germany i realized oh god it's not just my uh, existence as an ex muslim it's ex muslim and a trans woman which puts you at more risk of being violated and more risk of being killed because come on men can blaspheme but at least they are men women can blaspheme but at least they are women uh what about you tranny why the fuck are you even being uh, blasphemous so all those kind of things that were there and uh, so i started working with lgbtiq refugees that's how we say it in german it's lgbtiq it goes further but i just quit it to queer that's enough for me um and a large number of them either coming from christian countries uh, from african or from uh, south american countries or coming from the uh, african countries which are muslim uh, middle east and all other muslim majority countries they are not just only lgbtiq plus people they are also most of the time ex christians and ex muslims and they are in danger uh, for their lives and unfortunately the law in germany it's the lgbti plus the ex muslims it's almost impossible to make your decision uh, makers believe that you are saying the truth because both of these things are here and here and you can't just show them how it is to be an ex muslim ex christian or uh, somebody who is uh, gay or lesbian or trans or something like that so it's uh, very close to heart and it's very close to my own existence that's why it's a very important topic for me then mauritania Um, yeah, this is uh, very, very important for me because uh, when I was young, I asked the imam, why haven't had gates? Why does one who does good not go, not go to paradise? And he said, you must never ask such a, a question like that. And yeah, and then I start my journey. And in 2019, I, I wrote an article with a simple a question. Why does God not uh, protect his believer? And after a few hours, my life is changing. Uh, a fatwa was declared against me, demanding my death. That's mean anyone he can kill me. And uh, the de demonstration front in the largest mosque in in Waqshot, the capital of Mauritania, and also my citizenship has been refocused. And then my family belongs to uh, an extremist religious tribe called Tejakanat with a great influence in politics in Mauritania. And Mauritania, Mauritania is one of four countries in the world it call itself islamic republic that's mean whoever live islam punished by death and yeah in 2015 i when i was a, a student in cairo university i i create my own organization liberalist network mauritania to be the voice for non-believers uh, LGBT community in in Mauritania. In Mauritania, we have the basic human rights just for one kind of people, just the Muslims, and that's big, big, big 
uh, problems. And uh, also, I'm lucky to be here in Germany to, to give people a message. There's a lot of people suffering and also a freedom, not for free. You have to fight to say, I'm here, I deserve to be, uh, to have rights like you, to be here, uh, to get the same, uh, the same opportunity. Yeah. Ahmed Du. Thank you. First of all, I request to hall management, please increase a little bit cooling system, otherwise feeling uh, suffocation. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ahmedu Rashid Chaudhuri, but uh, most of the people knows me as a tutul. So I'm from Bangladesh. Right now I'm living in Norway as an exile. So actually, I, uh, <clears throat> my story is uh, uh, related to my uh, little magazine. So when I was uh, uh, started in 11th class, so that time I published a little magazine that's called the Shuddha Shore. It means the free voice in English. <clears throat> so, and that time actually um, I started the reading and uh, discussing and um, also a uh, little bit thinking maybe. So uh, uh, day by day I uh, read uh, many literature. Also I read the Quran and Hadith and uh, many Islamic literature also. And then I understand actually, um, I found uh, uh, in religious have a lot of uh, contradiction. And uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, learned to uh, compare uh, the theoretical uh, uh, religious or Islam and uh, some of our uh, societies, uh, the practitioner who are who are the very strictly um, uh, said they are very much uh, um, loyal to the Islam and they are the authority of Islam actually. So then, day by day, actually, uh, uh, I, I I came out from the my believingness, but uh, that was not anything. Uh, like the uh, present uh, situation, because at that time uh, was not Facebook, uh, was not Twitter or anything, so we didn't have to announce anything. But our friend circle and our uh, other uh, circle, so we can uh, share with our our thinking and our point of views about religious and other political issues. So. That, that was our, uh, that was my and, and some of my other friends also, uh, the story of, uh, that came out from the religious beliefness. So then uh, from the little magazine, I uh, uh, started the publication house in 2004, as the same name, Shuddha Shur Free Voice. And from 2004 to 2015, I published uh, more than uh, 1000 items books and I published uh, uh, more uh, uh, the controversial book also. Uh, that was the social taboos uh, critics, religious taboos critics. I published also the Abhijit Roy's books and um, another uh, Anantu Bijay Roy. Uh, so he, he was also hacked by the Islamist. So I published their first book also. And then um, at the same time, um, as a publisher, uh, as a uh, protector of um, anti-religious activities and promoter of anti-religious activities. So I also got uh, some threat. And 2015, October, uh, yeah, uh, they tried to kill me in my office, but luckily I survived. And then I got um, a scholarship from ICON, uh, and then I uh, moved to the Norway. So this is my uh, short history. So thank you very much. Hello, 
my name is Nina Sankari. The only thing that I would like to add to my presentation by Dan Barker, thank you very much, is that I am the editor of uh, the Atheist Review uh, in Polish, the very first uh, um, magazine with atheism in the title. Even under the so-called communist regime, there was no such uh, such magazines in Poland. This one, as you see, is the title of the number is Hatred. It, it is uh, religious hatred. We see in the center the um, lady who is responsible for the uh, education in uh, southern Poland, uh, who is uh, uh, with the rosaries, uh, who is chanting uh, against the demonstration in defense of LGBT rights. And now, very quickly, you were already speaking about 80s, about 80s days. We are organizing every year um, the last weekend of March. Interesting thing, the International 80s Days was installed after this event, but it is tw on 23 uh, March because uh, we did it a, a week ahead of the real um, real date of uh, execution, of commemoration of execution of our patron, Kazimierz Wyszczyński, the big philosopher, atheist, first atheist philosopher in Poland of 17th century. And we did it because we were refused to take the same streets on the same date that the holy procession of Easter. Now uh, we still uh, are doing it at the right time. Um, what I would like to say uh, also, we, are do we have uh, lots of activities, but it is not the essential. I would like to say to you that the change, so-called democratic transition in Poland and other countries of the so-called uh, post-communist area was done at the cost of the massive clerical reclericalization of those countries. So we have in Poland, we are crucified in Poland, starting with the big cross in the parliamentary hall and ending with the smallest post offices, uh, nurseries, etc. There is a cross everywhere. And, of course, I don't want to enter into the details. Maybe there will be another occasion. And it reflects unequally, unequally treatment of Catholics, other believers, and non-believers. Uh, Paul is a Catholic, is equal to Catholic. And the atheists are ex-Bolsheviks or something not uh, acceptable. So just to say that maybe you recall Lech Wałęsa, the big hero, inseparably of his holy, um, holy picture of Saint Mary, and our big, big intellectual, liberal intellectual uh, of opposition, Adam Michnik, who said that there is no atheist himself, who said there is no other moral for a Pole but the Catholic one. And it is not only Poland. You know, maybe, that Czech Republic is one who is the most, uh, most atheist in uh, this area. But the very big a leader of opposition, liberal and intellectual, Václav Havel, uh, signed the concordate with Vatican, but the Czech Republic parliament rejected it. And then he said, it's a very sad day. We now have a real atheist country without any moral compass. I don't know, maybe it's, it's uh, time now to cut. I, I, of course, we have a lot of, to say, but... Okay. Thank you, Nina. Then...
Hello. <laughs> yes, it is working. Well, being Spanish, I probably wouldn't need it anyway. Um, now, my name is Ana Gonzalez. I am a solicitor, which means it's a type of lawyer that you get in the, in the UK. We are very, very weird like that um, over there. And my main area of expertise is immigration, human rights, and asylum. And my big, a big part of my professional practice is uh, representing refugees and asylum seekers, and within that, apostates, uh, which is something that really um, pleases me, something that fills me with pride. Um, apostates and the LGBTI community, which interestingly, use, we, I use the same arguments, pretty much the same arguments for both cases, which is there's some incredible, spooky amount of overlap. Um, by terms of personal journey, I cannot compare with my esteemed panel here. I have had a very easy life by comparison. Um, I free moved from Spain um, to the UK. I, I became an atheist at the age of 13. I used to be a believer. I did my Holy Communion. I went to church by myself. My father was an atheist. He had an irrational, irrational, maybe not so irrational, but you know, seemed irrational hatred of the church and the traffic police for some reason. Um, never quite explain why, and because of that, because of that, I was really lucky. And as a teenager, I was not forced to go to church because most of the girls, uh, and I think my friend Nina here can relate to that. Most of women of our generation, um, as teenagers, had to be seen. The boys not so much. The, the girls had to be seen to go to church and take com and confession and things. Because my father was an atheist, I didn't have to go. So that was a big, big bonus. Really, really big bonus. I fell into the law completely by mistake, story for another day, and also I fell into human rights law also completely serendipitously and ended up in a fantastic law firm that I am very, very proud to be a part of called Wilson Solicitors LLP. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, who has campaigned for 35 years, worked. It's a, it's a private law firm, it's not an NGO. I want to make that very clear. Um, I don't want to get the brownie points of being an NGO because that wouldn't be right. Um, but we uh, still work within legal aid practices and do as much as we can to represent those without means, although the British government is making that very, very difficult at the moment. And we have done all sorts of work in asylum, and I am very, very proud of um, uh, of working with the Council of Ex-Muslims, which, of course, like everything else in my life, um, has been a complete accident. I, one of my clients, I met this family. Um, they were detained as a family in a, in a detention center in 2010. Won't give more details for obvious reasons, and they told me about their plight of being atheist, and I did realize that that would be a problem somewhere, but that had not really come onto my radar. I represented people from everywhere. At that point, I was mainly dealing with victims of trafficking, so my mind was, my legal mind was elsewhere. And then I became, I became um, acquainted with this issue, this monumental problem that you know, blasphemy is in the world today, which is mad, and is, is just completely incomprehensible to me personally, and no doubt to everybody in this room. And um, from then, I started working very close with the organization. I get, um, I do respect uh, clients, and I also do volunteer work. And I hesitate to say this because I don't want to think, uh, I don't want, it doesn't like a bit of a brag, but I have won every single atheist case so far. So, yeah. Because it can be done, it can be done. and then well we will speak more about that later i think i will pass to my the next panelist well i think i'm going to need your number then <laughs> my name is um harris sultan um i'm a i fell into my activism accidentally as well because uh, i was one of the early casualties of the new atheist movement back in 2005 i was um uh, my mum sent me to Australia to study. Um, I went there, accidentally ran into the New Atheist Movement and said, I, it, it's a very funny story. There was, uh, I, back in those days, I used to work at a petrol station uh, when I was studying. I, so there was free newspapers and I'd read a newspaper. And there was this news article written by this Christian Bible-thumping Australian journalist. And he was bashing Richard Dawkins. Um, I don't know who Richard Dawkins was at that point, and I was even though he was strawmanning him, and he would just take a line out, and then he would 
um, present his argument against it. But I was like, but the other guy makes more sense. And then, um, and then I thought, okay, I'll look it up. Um, and then I uh, ran into a documentary, etc. So anyway, so I became an atheist uh, by 2006 or seven. Um, but then I went on, lived my life. Um, being Pakistani, obviously, I was up to date with. I was keeping track of um, what's happening in Pakistan. And all of a sudden, in 2017, there was this massive crackdown on atheists. Um, and I was shocked. I I was totally oblivious of that because it didn't have any impact on my life. I was just living my life, everything was fine. I would go back and forth. And then I just asked myself, why is this person being arrested for believing in exactly what I believe in? Um, and then uh, I, I, I said, this is it, I'm going to talk about it. I didn't reveal my face for the first couple of months and then a month later when I started my Facebook page, um, this university student by the name of Mashal Khan, um, he was brutally lynched by a mob for simply asking, uh, why could God not create two pairs of humans, Adam and Eve? Um, so um, just because of that, the, he, he was hunted down in his, uh, in his hostel um, and he was, when his, he, was, he was killed by a mob who were also university students. Um, and that's when I decided that I'm going to show my face. And then I started writing my book and uh, you started a YouTube channel. Um, and then I realized how many atheists there are in Pakistan. Um, so, and a lot of them, we can't actually take them all out um, because there are, there are lots of organizations that help Ahmadis or Christians and they're all persecuted in these Muslim countries. But I think barring CFI um, and a couple more organizations, there's not really much happening for atheists, despite the fact that I think there are more, uh, in a very short amount of time, we're going to see a sea of refugees who are ex-Muslims and atheists coming from these Muslim countries. Right now, they're silent because, uh, for obvious reasons, as you can hear what happens to them. Um, but the kind of refugees, the, 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 the sea of refugees that we saw um, in 2011 and then whenever there's a war and uh, displacement, um, but these people are there and I think we or the West actually needs to think about this because it, th this is a major calamity that is just knocking on your door. So anyway, so I just got interested in, uh, in this topic and then when I started talking about it, I, I realized now that's, that, that, that's heavy on people like me as well because a couple of people who actually became atheists after listening or reading my book, um, they were also killed in Pakistan. Um, and I've had thousands of letters, so anyway, so, so that's why I think it's uh, important that we talk about these, because whether whether Islamic countries whether they like it or not, there's a sea of uh, apostates coming. It, your book is in English. They can read it in Pakistan. Sorry. Your book is in English. Yeah. It's been translated. In ah, okay. He said it's been translated into languages. So, Urdu and Hindi. so uh, before we move on to talk about immigration and asylum, do any of you have an, addi an additional story of discrimination or persecution that is relevant to our topic today? Uh, Nina. Of course, in Poland, atheists are not persecuted in a way they are in many countries, and we heard lots of stories. But there are many cases of um, discrimination in laws and in practice. And I will say now I have a problem. My passport is um, valid uh, until two years. It is uh, the, the date of validity is two years later. And the new passports we are receiving now are with the, with the uh, slogan, God, honor, 
patria. The, this slogan is historically belonging to our nationalists, in fact, fascists. I have a personal choice. What am I supposed to do? What would you do? I have no possibility to change the law. I have no possibility, even there was very plain, even uh, directed to EU, nothing changed. Shall I just reject my passport or, and, uh, and stay closed in Poland or what? The American money has in God we trust on it, but I spend it, you know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, By the way, your money, you spend the best way possible. Big <laughs> thanks to Freedom From Religious Foundation. <laughs> Big thank you, because you funded our action, Humanists Without Borders, uh, uh, helping us to organize help for refugees for Ukraine, but not only. L Lilith has a question. Sorry. Um, so uh, we have the same thing in Pakistan, as Haris also knows. Um, when we um, actually apply for passport, we have to claim that the Ahmadiyya group, which is subsect or a sect in Islam, they are non-Muslims, and we trust only that the Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet of God. I wish he had better plans, the God. Um, he could have thought better, actually. Um, and this is something where I also had issues with my government. Like, I had to renew my passport in this country twice, and every time you have to go and tell them that you believe that the Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet. I don't believe in that. But still, you have to do it just because uh, I'm a legal entity belonging to this country. Um, so that's another issue on which we can also discuss uh, as... Uh, Anna knows it, legal entities and uh, changing borders and all those things. It's a, it's a huge mess. It's a huge mess around the world that we are actually part of the country we are accidentally born into. Same like we are born into a religion or anything, or in my case, even a body. Yeah. Sorry. Um I just want to say this is something not personal to me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to give examples of my clients' cases because that would be inappropriate, even though I can talk about general things and the things that everybody knows. But I do want to uh, mention something that happened in Spain in the, la in the last couple of years. And is this the case that was brought by the Association of Catholic Lawyers, which I didn't even know existed. They do exist. And uh, yes, I do. You know, but I'm sure you know more than. Of course, they do. They do. They do. And they brought proceedings under the Constitution on blasphemy charges. There is no blasphemy offence in Spain, interestingly, with our history, uh, but recent. But there is um, there is something in the Constitution to the effect that every this freedom of religion you cannot offend somebody else's religion. But it's very wishy washy and very very general. So there was this uh, this artist, this drug artist called Drug Settlers from the Canary Islands, very famous, featured in the Drug Race Spain. If anybody watches the show here, here in the UK, and he was brought to court, and he won, but he actually had to be dragged through the courts and publicly humiliated just because of his art, and it, merely because he appeared like the Virgin Mary. That's all he did. Now, I would, I wish <laughs> the Association of Catholic Lawyers went to see my favorite drag queen, who is called Virgin Extravaganza in the UK. And then that's, oh, good, okay, another fun, good, okay. So, <laughs> so Virgin Extravaganza does only the Virgin Mary, and the level of blasphemy is off the charts. And I, it would shock some of you here, I promise you. That is how good she is. They are. They are. Yeah, that's how good they are. And that happened in Spain in the last couple of years. So I thought I would just mention that. That it's not just about the Islamic countries. Yes, of course, the situation is much worse because people get prosecuted, persecuted and killed. That doesn't quite happen in Poland, that doesn't quite happen in Europe. It's bad, but these things do happen and they still they need to remain on our radar. Yeah, 
there is two things, bad and good, in the same time. The good things, you have your own identity. You, are, you, you have your own identity as, as atheist. But the bad things, you will lost everything. Your family, your country, even the basic human rights. You are not a human anymore in this in this area. You you will lose your uh, the basic things, your nationality. That's yeah, and also uh, yeah, I lost. Uh, I can visit the place I grow uh, on. This you can't return to Mauritania. Yeah. Immediately, I will be killed. It's Islamic Republic. That is. Yeah. Do you feel like a man without a country, a person without a country? Uh, I can't say that. I can't say that because the country is inside me. Uh, Mauritania is inside me. It's not a place. It's something, something inside me. But yeah, I have to fight not just for me, but for people like me. Yeah, in Bangladesh, uh, in my uh, 14 years old, I am. So in this time, yeah, I have seen uh, the two different scenario. So I remember in my childhood time, in my city, yeah, I came from the uh, one of the Eastern religious cities, Silet. So. <clears throat> So I remembered um, in my childhood, um, one of the, our municipality election, so some of the, uh, the chairman candidate, the mayor candidate, were uh, they're uh, promoting themselves. So that time, uh, maybe my father and some others, uh, aged person, they are discussing about who is the best candidate. So one person, still now I'm, uh, hearing these words, uh, he is the best person, he is the best candidate. But his one problem, he is atheist. But nobody killed him. I know, uh, but nobody attacked him. He could uh, successfully uh, finish his election. So people's uh, mentality like that, uh, that time, also, you know, uh, in Bangladesh and almost South Asia, have uh, one of the uh, the folk singer groups uh, in Bangladesh and uh, the West Bengal. So that's called the Baul. Uh, yeah, they are. They have a, a different philosophy also, uh, but this philosophy is very much um, contradictory with the Quran and Hadith Sharia. But metaphorically, they used the when they. Uh, uh, shown their respect, uh, the Allah, Khuda, Rasul, that's kind of. So, but uh, uh, the frequently they are um, arranging their uh, the program and uh, they are the two uh, singer, uh, one, one singer give uh, one kind of uh, logic, so another one is uh, just give the answer. And people are enjoying, and um, whole night almost, they are enjoying this kind of. So that was the scenario. But after I think uh, day by day, when uh, the politics, power politics are engaged uh, with the diff and also the military bureaucracy in Bangladesh, the military bureaucracy are very much Islamized, like in Pakistan, I think. So, um, but their their uh, involvement with. Uh, they are poli uh, in Bangladeshi politics, actually. Uh, so we have seen after 2013s, they listed the bloggers' name, they listed the artist name, uh, writers' name, publishers' name, and they started the attack. Were you so attacked um, before Avijit or after Avijit? After Avijit. Avijit was um, uh, hacked in 2015s February. Yeah. So in front of our uh, the book fair stall. Um, so the, they are having one book launch program. Yeah. So that was his uh, the last book. That was a that was a horrible year for free thinkers in Bangladesh. Is it is it better now or is it still the same or worse in Bangladesh? 
Uh, right now, uh, no, nobody feel uh, better or free, but um, the governments uh, uh, took a little bit uh, different uh, maybe policy because of uh, uh, sanctions of uh, the US and other European countries. So for that, we, we think uh, it's a, just for waiting for uh, the better opportunity <laughs> for do something. But people are uh, actually uh, give stretch their lips and stop their writing. Does Muktamona still exist? Mm -hmm. Muktamona I still exist. You know, the blog, Muktamona, that Avijit was... Yeah, it, it, is, it is running yeah. still now, but it's not from Bangladesh. No. And not like a, um, the people are not attending like a, uh, the five years ago. Or, yeah, One of the Muktamona bloggers is there. Uh -huh. Any other stories before we move on? Uh, very shortly, we have a good news too. Uh, according to the Pew Research Institute, Poland is a global leader in living church in the category of youth 18 to 44, uh, 84. So, Anna, you deal with um, asylum seekers and, That's correct. And, and immigrants and that. So you, you would have some perspective on how difficult it is, at least in Britain, uh, for... Right? ex-Muslims to find asylum. What are the problems you experience there? Okay, the main problems with the UK asylum system is being believed um, because immigration and asylum, just like the rest of Europe, it has been heavily politicized. Um, refugees, asylum seekers are being scapegoated. Um, many of you will, well, there are lots of people from the UK here, but <clears throat> many of you will have heard about the infamous Rwanda scheme my, our firm is part of the legal team that is challenging that. We we'll have a hearing at the High Court in a couple of weeks. So this is how bad it has become, how bad it has become for refugees and asylum seekers, generally speaking. And of course, um, there have been some positives in the sense that when the war in the Ukraine, something unprecedented happened, this visa, which is not refugee status, very, very important to say, this three-year renewable visa was just basically given pretty much to everybody. We rolled out the, 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 the red carpet, which was amazing. I have never seen in the 25 years I've been working in asylum, I've never seen anything like that. That was wonderful. But then I thought to myself, what about the Syrians? What about the others? Um, what about those? Um, you don't want to look a gift, give horse in, horse in the mouth, but it wasn't particularly, particularly uh, good to think, and we all know why um, this happened, and, but we're not going to go into that because we've got other things to discuss. So um, the main issue about asylum is being believed. So in my experience, um, the Home Office, which is the government department that deals with, uh, with asylum and immigration, or the UK VI, as is also, also known, is not hostile to apostates. I have to say that. And my personal experience is that, and the reason why I think we've been rather successful with these particular cases, is because there are not very many in comparison to other categories of applicants. And I'm not going to mention any nationalities because I don't want to pick on anybody necessarily, which of course I wouldn't do, but I don't want to come, to come across that way. So there are larger groups of people, um, taking aside the Ukrainians, they got their own scheme, lucky them, um, but there are not very many of those. Also, the Home Office, even though they're not particularly enlightened about anything, um, they do understand, seem to understand that it would be easier it would, um, they think that everybody's lying. Everybody's on the take, everybody's lying. They've got this refusenik, sort of semi-Soviet paranoia type of uh, view of things. But they do understand that a Muslim might fake being a homosexual, but will not fake being an infidel. They seem to understand that. They seem to understand that. Um, also, the other thing as well, and this is an element of intersectionality when it comes to these claims, is that most of my clients are incredibly articulate because many of them are very, um, they are very, um, very educated people. Many of them, um, they, a very common theme that I see in my clients that come to the UK as students or work permits, but you, mainly as students, they, are, they, they might have a some doubt in their mind, or they might be like super believers, but they come to the UK, open society, go to uni, meet people from all over the world, internet, free, with all sorts of things, books, everything. And then they come to a sort of coming out, go through a coming out 
um, just another parallel with the LGBTI, so a coming out journey, and then they realize that they no longer believe, which means they cannot go back to their own countries. So then what do they do? Most people don't realize, I'm not going to go too much into this because I'm speaking later, doing a workshop on this, but um, what do they do? Most people don't realize there is asylum, but there is asylum, and I will explain later, later why. So in my experience, my clients, the clients that I deal with, they are not like the victim of trafficking from Nigeria who gets brought to the UK to do the most heinous things and can barely read and write and doesn't even know what a passport looks like. I used to have one of my old passports in my, in, in my, in, in my office just to show to them, did the person have something like this to get on the plane? So this is how, how um, the disparity in backgrounds in, in the, the clients that I represent. Apostates are not like that. They know how to hold an argument. Sometimes they know how to speak. Sometimes a bit too much, I have to say. It's a good thing, it's a good thing. But not with the home office. Stick to the question, answer the question. So, um, and, and so that is a massive, a massive advantage when you are in front of a government official. A massive advantage. Then if you've got, if you're properly advised and you have got the benefit of, um, and there is legal aid for these cases. There is legal aid because it's asylum. So even though we haven't got much legal aid for many things, there is legal aid. Uh, if you've got the advantage of having a little bit, um, a little bit of legal advice, sometimes I have to be honest, I don't even have to work that hard on these cases. Uh, there are other cases that really take all my, all my uh, mental energy and all my legal muscles, really. When it comes to apostate cases, particularly from the usual Islamic countries, not all of them, um, it's not really that difficult. You're pretty much knocking on an on open door because the evidence is there and it's self-evident with the, the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. Having said that, and I have got permission from my client to mention this, I did have the most shocking refusal four years ago, it was a female apostate from Saudi Arabia who was refused. So now, if a female apostate from Saudi Arabia cannot have asylum, nobody can, quite frankly. Nobody can. Because that's even more dangerous than Salman Rushdie, if you know, at a push, really. So that was, and they sent me an, an 11, 11 page letter full of nonsense, which, long story short, I managed to sort of get it over time. We didn't have to go to court. She was fine, you know, she's a refugee, that's fine, we moved on from that. But stuff like that can happen. So, but that is very, very unusual, very unusual. Normally, if you present the case, um, sometimes the case just present themselves. Uh, Pakistan, they got blasphemy laws. Saudi Arabia, we know. Iran, we know. You have, we have to, have to work hard in places like Algeria, Tunisia, and places like that when it's not that clear cut. Bangladesh can be problematic as well, because Bangladesh, there's so many elements there, and it's not always state agents. So there's blasphemy laws, there's also uh, the, the particular groups like Jamaat al Islami. But when it comes to asylum, it's not so much about the law. The law is important, of course it is, um, but it's mainly the evidence. Evidence is king always, every the skin. So I'd like to ask, uh, in any of these countries like Australia or Britain or Poland or Norway or Germany, uh, do or can asylum seekers claim uh, religious persecution as a reason for seeking to immigrate? Is that a category? Are you asking me? I, well, any of you who yeah. have okay. dealt yes. with this problem in any of your countries. Generally speaking, they should be. But, but have you dealt with some of them who claim that as their specific reason? Okay, so the main thing about the, the Refugee Convention that I will explain later is that there has to be, there are some countries like Germany that does not, does not accept um, um, non-state agents of persecution. That's why there have been some issues with Somali cases in the past and things. But if you are persecuted by the government, like you would be by Saudi Arabia, by Pakistan, then you should be giving asylum in Germany or any country signatory to the convention. What about Australia? Do you know anything about that, uh, Harris? I'm, I'm no expert, but um, you, where you said, um, yeah, well, I, I try to look into it as much as I can, but it, where you said um, that, the, at least in the UK, the government officials know that a Muslim would fake being a homosexual but not an apostate. Um, this is true, but Australia is probably the worst country when it comes to taking refugees. 
And I think um, we're, we're, the, our numbers are the smallest compared to anyone. I think Canada is probably the most generous one. Um, but but having said that, what you said, it, it is true. Um, I because uh, I sometimes write letters to the immigration department when they ask me, "What do you think is this person uh, an ex-Muslim or not?" And there was one ex-Muslim apostate. His application has been in the system for nearly four years now, um, and I think still hasn't been approved. But then. One day he just called me and said, Haris Bhai, um, I wish I had just claimed to be a homosexual because there was this guy uh, who applied for it but, uh, on the basis of being homosexual and he was given um, a permanent residency, I think within a year or two. Um, but then something funny happened and uh, when he was granted the, uh, the permanent residency, he went back to Pakistan and... Uh, got married to a woman and then brought and then he applied for her visa and the immigration officer said to him <laughs> that, uh, what happened i thought you were gay but he said no i read the quran and i'm cured <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, norway or, or germany would do you know any? i know one person um a one cartoonist iranian cartoonist he deported from australia and now he got the asylum in norway for religious persecution yeah. uh, all together yeah yeah and also i have uh, i want to share another uh, story uh, very recently uh, one couple from in uh, middle east uh, nearer countries i don't want to mention their name or uh, very specific anything so <clears throat> they um, uh, one he became an atheist and another one he became a christian so I asked them, why? So they said, okay, uh, maybe it will help us to get uh, asylum and, and <laughs> another facility uh, very early. One last year. Um, yeah, uh, Germany does that. And uh, in people here, they get asylum on the basis of religious uh, persecution or lack of religion, both. Uh, and the community has even their prophet living in this country anyways. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that's there, but um, I advise people, I do counseling, I do almost the same work that Jimmy does. I always tell people, uh, tell your story truly, don't fake anything, but still there are people, as Harris said, they're like, you know, please, I'm also from Pakistan, you're also from Pakistan, can you please help me? And I'm like, what? Uh, can you please testify in the court that I'm homosexual? I was like, no, I can't. I can't. Why should I do that? Because if the same homosexual person would be living in, the same person living in Pakistan, he would be damn against homosexuality. And here in this country where it's given a right to live as a same-sex uh, partnership and uh, having sex and everything is okay, uh, why are you using that card? Why are you playing this card? Can you accept a homosexual child of your own? They won't. They won't. They won't do that. And LGBTI people and atheist and ex-Muslims people, we have many things in common. And that is that we are the devil's advocate. We are the devil's in personification. And let me say just one last thing. Um, this is something that we really need to pay attention to in our work as activists and as counselors or even as people who are talking to a great number of audiences. Your genitals are the most holiest part of your body. Thanks to Elohim, Yahweh, Allah, and whoever came after that and before that, these are the worst ideas that put your genitals as the worst part in your bodies and told you not to touch them, do not play with them, do not have any conscious relationship with your genitals because the moment you will have this, women included especially, especially women included, you are going to go to hell and burn for eternity. The biggest problem in this entire world is a non, uh, uh, non how do you say it, uh, natural 
and a very toxic relationship with your genitals. It's, it's, and a large number of these groups, different religions and also other, which are minute religions and tribes, they circumcise you, they mutilate your genitals just to avoid you having that player that has been put in by the nature in you. And this is something we need to talk about very openly, open discussions. When I do my workshops, I'm like, say the word penis and testicles. Say the word vulva. People don't say that. Germans don't say that. <laughs> and I'm like, please say it. How do you identify a ma male or a female body? Those are the two basic things to identify them. Say it. And when I'm doing that, there are also Muslims, non-Muslims, Christians, and all that. And the funniest part is I try to make things funny because that's the only way human beings uh, uh, digest things, otherwise they don't, uh, is that, OK, if somebody has said penis and uh, uh, testicles, I'm like, that's how you take it in the mouth. <laughs> that's the right way of doing it. So nimmt man das in den Mund. Thank you. Für alle Deutschen. Well, maybe you just gave me an idea for a song. Or maybe Shelly. Uh, uh, can, we could write a song. Oh, we can go to questions now. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. We will now take questions from the audience. Thanks so much. My name is Sammy Gerges, and I work with Freedom House. Hey. <laughs> Good morning or afternoon. Um, I have a question for you. Both, all of you passed through a hard time to get a protection. And we know that when we talk about atheists, there's a very small resources for protection. If you can tell us more about what kind of a challenge did you face in order to get help, especially for Yahya or Ahmadur and also for your listeners. That's very, very important. I talk about this because I work with Freedom House and we have this program mainly to provide protection for people who are persecuted because of religion. And we work with a lot of people and I'm happy to see some of our uh, groups that benefit from us here. And we provide medical assistance, we provide legal assistance, we provide relocation. Because when it comes to incidents that threats people who are atheists, it is very violent. And protection is very important and it should be very rapid. And without acting so quickly, these people can actually die. That's why the resource of protection for atheists has to be stressed. We need to work with different government to allow more resources for people. We see that. A lot of people are persecuted from Christian community or from Ahmadiyya community or from all this. They have resources. It is very, very easy for them to go to a religious leader. It is easy to go to a church. It is easy to go to a mosque. It is easy to go this. But for you, where, where did you get this um, kind of help? My contact, I will be here for two days for you guys. I would love to speak with you. We have this program available. And I would love to get your contact. And also, if there's any incident or anything that we can help, I am happy to do this. Thank you. Thank you. There's a workshop later on. You could join that workshop. That would be great, I think. Yeah. I, um, I wanted to add on that point. I actually want to talk about it. That there's one um, example, and Anna, you could probably shed more light on it. Canada seems like it's the only exception to the rule where every, I think there are 25 countries that follow UNHCR program. Um, and only Canada is an exception that has 125 organizations, I think it's called Sponsorship Agreement Holder, where an organization can do its own work and they can treat uh, a person, they can sponsor it to the, um, to the Canadian immigration as, um, as a possible asylum seeker. And they can just bypass this whole UNACR program and they can go into it. Um, 99 out of those 125 organizations um, 
they are uh, Christian organizations, or maybe a couple of them are Ahmadis or whatever. Uh, there are the rest are region based. So the even in that part, we don't have any secular organization doing any representation. So and Canada seems like the most generous option for atheists to actually go there, um, and and that, that's why that a lot of work needs to be done, uh, because the normal the standard UNHCR process that is, and as I said, there's a sea of uh, apostates coming from these Muslim countries. Um, you can have all kinds of asylum seekers there, whether it could be Christian persecution and LGBTQ persecution, anything. It could be anything. But um, but we need at least one organization. And as you said, where do we go? There's actually, for atheists in Muslim countries, there's actually no place to go. Oh, thank you. Uh, in Germany, it's the Secular uh, Refugees Relief, and I would ask you guys to, if you can, also donate for them, uh, because they're working on this all alone, literally all alone, without any funds, without any government uh, support, uh, although in Germany there is a lot of government support, because we don't work on the system of charity, as in UK. UK is so much fond of charity. They love it. I don't know why. And Germany, on the other end, is like, it's our duty. We need to do it. So it's more like a proper state. So please, if you can help them uh, with donations, because the government is not helping them, because government thinks there is no need for the secular refugees uh, to have a separate organization. And we have to convince the new government now, the older one, the city who is now gone. Let's see what happens. Thank you. May I answer? Down? May oh, answer? Nina has yeah. something to say, okay. No, just to answer. Uh, of course, in Poland, uh, atheists uh, don't receive any institutional help. It's, and it is not a uh, reason, uh, at least I don't know any case uh, that uh, the asylum was granted because of atheism. But uh, there are international organizations, we know uh, for example, human inter uh, Humanist International uh, have a project, uh, Humanist at Risk, and the Atheist Alliance International have also the program Atheist at Risk, something like that, but they are doing their job and they are saving lives. So, uh, first, those two organizations internationally uh, try are trying to help and I know many cases in the case of our small foundation we have in our bylaws uh, inscribed the help for atheists in need and we are doing it at our level um, yeah, there are some cases I, I, I will not uh, speak about it but I think there is a need there is a need just to make a network, a network of separated organizations to, to install such a fund and uh, with such a function. Uh, just I added two points. Um, yes, it's true. The protection is very limitation, facility is very limited. But I think some of the international organizations now are arranging some uh, uh, security courses um, inside of a country and outside of a country. And also they are uh, trying to uh, give some support to uh, the at-risk writer and artist and others. But I think, <clears throat> yeah, um, uh, the organization, uh, they can increase their uh, work inside of Bangladesh and uh, yeah, they can give the mental support and some other uh, security support. I cannot explain everything because uh, the, uh, the different people have a different kind of the security problem. So uh, uh, as per my experience, uh, when I got uh, uh, the threat, uh, I tried to contact some uh, the organization, but I uh, unfortunately I didn't get uh, any response. So uh, I think um, if the organization uh, increased their work, 
increase their network in inside of country so maybe uh, the at risk uh, the people will get some uh, mental and other support and uh, yeah they can find out for uh, surviving uh, inside of their country they can uh, keep their uh, own uh, uh, job and uh, other activities so uh, it's very difficult because uh, government are not uh, the democratic. Uh, they are not uh, accepting any uh, freedom of speech and uh, people's expression. So uh, yeah, we have to wait for a, a democratic country, democratic value added country. But uh, by this time, I think uh, as a uh, the good friend of uh, at risk writer and artist, uh, the international organizations um, um, can uh, increase their activities in uh, the Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. We've got two questions, last two questions, one over there and one over here. Can I? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, about the credibility of atheists in the asylum process, I would like to um, introduce a rather unique arrangement that my country has, um, and they have been rather successful, and I wanted to ask you whether you have tried the same approach, maybe. I don't want to disclose my country, it's in Europe, because I don't want to endanger the process and the people working on it. Um, but the thing is, uh, one of the atheist organizations in my country uh, tried to um, establish atheism as a religion for um, the government in order to have the same rights as religions. And they have found a Christian theologian um, working with atheist asylum seekers. And he... Um, gives a certificate after interviewing them that they are atheists. If he, of course, uh, believes they are. So, because the problem is that we in our country, we don't have an official institution that can say they are atheists. It's just organizations who can say whatever they want. But since Christianity is very well established in my country, and if a Christian theologian confirms they are atheists, they have more credibility in the asylum seeking process last question one here and then uh, um, one here and then after that yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Off the zone. Um, hi uh, i wanted to ask the a question to the authors and the publishers how they keep the how the publishers keep the authors safe and how authors keep themselves and their loved ones safe from um, from threats um, also, I think there's one final comment from that corner, Mariam, she's dying to ask, make a comment. Uh, Dan, I'm just conscious of time. We don't want to eat into people's lunch time. No, no. You, uh, we're you finishing. We, you finish, we, sh we should finish now. I think final question and just a couple of minutes, I think, to wrap up, if you don't mind. Thank you. Can, can I just make some really important points, I think, that is missing from the discussion. One is that the right to asylum is a fundamental right. There are millions of people, billions even really, who need safety and protection, who are not getting it, who are not getting it. Majority are going to the third world. It is a human rights scandal. They talk about Jewish people being turned away during Nazi era. The same thing is happening today. People are dying, literally dying to get in. So I think that's very key for us to discuss. The other issue is that, you know, atheism is an individual your right. We don't need some theologian uh, wasting our time telling us we're atheists or not. The only reason we have to do this is because of the absurd rules of the Home Office. You don't believe us, well too bad. I decide what my beliefs are, not you. And I think that's the second uh, issue. Um, the final thing I want to say, which is really important, but because I'm getting so excited, I've of course forgotten, is this, that rights are for everyone. And it's not enough just to defend the rights of atheists. It's important to defend the rights of everyone to asylum. It is a human rights issue. I personally believe in open borders. I know no one's going to clap about that. But I think <laughs> if, you know, as Anna said, if a, an apostate woman from Saudi Arabia doesn't get asylum, who should? If any free thinker, if a woman, if a gay person, if a religious minority, if a sexual minority in any of those countries wants asylum, they have a right to it. Fuck you, Home Office, and fuck you, all governments that don't let people in. Thank you. Thank you. I think this concludes our panel. Thank you all of you for your very intelligent remarks. Uh, and I think we can set Mariam to music. I think done. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you please give up for the all, all, all the panelists, please. Thank you.
little bit. Uh, let's uh, Anna do a workshop.